Hi, I'm Matthew Burchette, and on this episode of Curator on the Loose, we're gonna take a look at the history of airliners using the planes in our collection, and that is a pretty big collection, and we're gonna do it in less than 15 minutes. So I got my running shoes on, and I better get going. Okay, Boeing's Model 40 was built for a 1925 U.S. Post Office competition to replace the ex-military de Havilland DH-4 that had been carrying airmail since the end of World War I in 1918. Luckily, the Model 40A, which first flew on May 20th, 1927, used an air-cooled Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine which was about 200 pounds lighter than the water-cooled engines powering Boeing's competitors. The 40A was the first Boeing airplane that could carry airline passengers. It had a tiny cabin for two people, cargo space for mail, and an open cockpit for the pilot. That sounds like fun in the winter, don't it? <laughs> no. Boeing built 77 Model 40s of all types, but it had something bigger and better up its sleeve. And let's go check that out. How you doing? Okay, until about the mid-1920s, American commercial airplanes were built for mail, not people. But the Model 40 proved that carrying people could be profitable. To cash in, Boeing began designing the first aircraft specifically for passenger operations, the Model 80. The Model 80 was a new breed of passenger aircraft. It had a heated cabin and leather seats. There were individual reading lights for passengers and the lavatory featured hot and cold running water. The museum's Model 80A1 retired from service with United Airlines in 1934 and it was recovered from a dump in Anchorage in 1960 and brought to Seattle for restoration. The restoration project of the aircraft served as the catalyst to establish a museum that later became the Museum of Flight. And now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Okay, I don't know how many of these I can do. Boeing's revolutionary Model 247, developed in 1933, was a game changer. It was an all metal twin engine airplane and the first really modern passenger airliner. It had gyroscopic instruments for IFR flying, an autopilot, pneumatically operated de icing equipment, variable pitch props, and retractable landing gear. Plus, the 247 cruised at 180 miles per hour and made scheduled flights from New York to LA in just 20 hours, seven hours faster than the previous airliners. But Boeing couldn't stay on top forever. Another company was waiting in the wings with a design to knock the 247 off its pedestal. Let's go check it out. Ooh, yeah, getting it in. Okay, the Douglas DC-2 was developed from the successful DC-1 prototype and introduced in 1934. Now, the new plane was nearly identical to the DC-1, but it had bigger engines, was faster, and had a longer range. More importantly, it carried 14 passengers instead of 12. It also featured an all-metal fuselage and wings, retractable landing gear, and variable pitch propellers that gave it amazing takeoff and landing characteristics. With plush seats, a kitchen, and a roomy restroom, the DC-2 set a new standard for comfort. Even the passenger compartment was insulated to keep noise levels down. The DC-2 served as Douglas's pattern for the next aircraft and proved that passenger air travel could be comfortable, safe, and reliable. 
Okay. So many stairs. Okay. In 1934, American Airlines asked Douglas for a version of the DC-2 that could carry overnight passengers. Douglas gave them two versions. An overnight version, the Douglas Sleeper Transport, and a day version called the DC-3. The DST was the height of luxury. 14 seats were folded in pairs to form seven berths while seven more dropped from the cabin ceiling. The DST was wider, longer, and had more powerful engines than the DC-2, and its larger tail gave it better directional stability. By 1939, more than 90% of the nation's airline passengers were flying on DC-2s or DC-3s. Today, hundreds are still flying passengers or cargo more than 70 years after the last DC-3 rolled off the line. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, Lockheed began working on a new design for a four-engine pressurized airliner in 1937. In 1939, TWA requested a 40-passenger transcontinental airliner with a range of 3,500 miles, which was well beyond the capabilities of the current design. TWA's requirements led to the L049 Constellation. The Model 49 took its first flight in 1943, but by then the war was in full swing and most of the planes destined for TWA went to the Army as C-69 transports. After the war, the Connie was improved with larger fuel tanks, a bigger payload, and more powerful engines. Lockheed then introduced the even bigger L-1049 Super Constellation in 1950. Okay, we gotta go up north. Travel time doesn't count. Miss my mark. The British de Havilland DH-106 Comet was the world's first commercial jet airliner. The Comet 1 prototype made its first flight in 1949 and featured a slender fuselage with four turbojet engines buried in the wing roots. It had a quiet, comfortable, pressurized cabin with large windows and when it debuted in 1952, it was cutting edge tech. But when three comets broke up in flight in highly publicized accidents, the comet was immediately withdrawn from service and extensively tested. And sadly, the improved Comet 4 took four years to design and produce, and by the time it went into service, it had been surpassed by other, more advanced aircraft. Now the museum's comet, this guy behind me, is the first Comet 4C variant built and it flew with Mexicana Airlines until 1970. How cool is that? Okay, we gotta go back to the main museum, but I am not facing that traffic again. So I'm gonna try something I've never done before. All right, here we go. Hold on, one more time. Oof. Ooh, it's like disapparating. Okay, Boeing President William Allen had a vision that the future of commercial aviation was jet powered. In 1952, Boeing spent 16 million of its own money to build the pioneering 367-80, 
better known as the Dash 80. The Dash 80 prototype led directly to the 707. The width and length of its fuselage gave it the largest passenger cabin in the air. Over 100 windows allowed airlines to rearrange seats to their liking, and passenger doors on the left side at the front and rear of the cabin became standard for all subsequent Boeing jets. Now I know what you're thinking, that's Air Force One. You're right. The first jet-powered Air Force One was built from a Boeing 707. Now stop interrupting, we're on a tight schedule. Okay. Boeing 727 was designed for smaller airports with shorter runways than used by the bigger 707. The 727 was the first Boeing jetliner to undergo demanding fatigue testing. The first to have completely powered flight controls and the first to use triple slotted flaps and the first to have an auxiliary power unit which eliminated the need for ground power or starting equipment, which made the plane really popular with developing countries that didn't have extensive airport infrastructure. The 727 made its first flight on February 9, 1963. Originally, Boeing planned to build 250 of the aircraft. However, they proved so popular that a total of 1,832 were built. Our Bird is the very first 727 built and it flew with United Airlines. Okay, on to other stuff. We're getting there. By the mid 1960s, Boeing was synonymous with big multi-engine jet aircraft. But when the company announced its new jet, the 737, it was quickly nicknamed the Baby Boeing. Now, to say the 737 was popular is an understatement. Boeing set a Guinness World Record for highest production large commercial jet when the 10,000th 737 rolled out the doors at Renton on March 13, 2018. Our 737 is the first baby Boeing. It was used for flight tests and certification, but never carried revenue passengers. In 1974, the plane was bought by NASA to serve as a flying lab and flew until it retired in 1997. And it looks really cool. All right, next one. Oh, why did I do this to myself? Okay. British and French aerospace companies began collaborating in 1962 on a design for a supersonic transport. The first flight of the French-built prototype occurred in March 1969, followed by the British-built aircraft a month later. Concorde could fly from London to New York and back in the same time it took a conventional airliner to go just one way. The Olympus 593 engine with its inlet and exhaust design drove the aircraft over two times the speed of sound at altitudes up to 60,000 feet. It was also the only turbojet with an afterburner in commercial service during its flying career. Okay, we're almost done, I swear. Okay, as airlines embraced the jet, 50,000 Boeing employees called the Incredibles built the new 747 in just 16 months. The 747 was truly monumental in size. The fuselage was 230 feet long, the wingspan 196 feet wide, and the cargo hold had room for 3,400 pieces of baggage, but it could be unloaded in just seven minutes. Now, our aircraft was the very first 747 ever built and was known by Boeing as RA-001. After certification, the aircraft served as a test bed for technology and engine development for other Boeing commercial jets, including the monster engines for the 777. All right, on we go. Okay, Whew. 
First known as the 7E7, the 787 was developed to provide non-stop service at speeds similar to the 747 and 777. Using lightweight composite materials in 50% of its primary structures, fewer pneumatically operated devices, advanced aerodynamics, and providing exceptional comfort and convenience for its passengers and crew, the 787 also uses 20% less fuel than previous aircraft in its class. Now, the Museum 787 was the third Dreamliner built. It first flew on March 14, 2010. In addition to its role in the flight test and certification program, Boeing flew it to 23 countries during a global marketing dream tour, circumnavigating the globe several times in the process. The aircraft's interior is partially configured as an airliner and as that flight test aircraft to commemorate its really cool history. We did it. Thank you guys for coming on this amazing journey. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube. Leave comments, leave questions, and smash that like button. All right, I'm done. Woo! Right. My car is at pain. <laughs> oh no. Why? No. No. <laughs>